Welcome to the Finding the Magic podcast, where books come alive. I'm Tricia Copeland, a fiction author and host of this show. If you love books, finding great reads, and hearing about the story behind the story directly from the authors, this is the place for you. Whether you like fantasy, science fiction, dystopian, or romance titles, I think you'll find something to love in my playlist. Listen in to discover something magical about a book or two today. Hi, Brett. Hello. How are you today? I'm excellent. How about yourself? I'm good. Today I'm hosting Brett Como. He has a new fantasy slash horror book. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Tell me more about fantasy slash horror. Um, The... For this book, at least, the analogy I like to give people is if Harry Potter happened in a horror world, this is what Nameless vs. the Army of the Dead would be. It's a little on the darker side, but it touches on similar themes of coming of age, that type of thing. So would you consider it a YA book? or an adult? I would. Okay. It's a YA. It's I wrote it specifically. All the, the main characters are 15, 16 years old, so I wrote it with that audience in mind. So, you know, there is action. There is some violence. There's romance, but not out of sexual nature, just romance, like kid romance type of stuff. Right. So on a horror rating, what is it psychological horror or is it, a, are there deaths or how, mm-hmm. how, what kind of horror are we talking here? Uh, it's, it's more like an action horror. So it's, it's more the theme, the, the mood of the, the story is a little darker, but it's much more action. The way I always like, when I read a horror book, I want a character, if you took a bunch of action heroes and put them in a horror movie, what would that story look like? And that's similar to what this is. So I'm thinking a little bit Stranger Things like, is that correct? Yep. Um, Stranger Things would be a good analogy. You could also look at The 13th Warrior, uh, which is the adaption of Eaters of the Dead. So similar to that, where the the villains are kind of mysterious, but our heroes aren't just running and hiding. They're actually trying to solve the problem. Okay, fine. We'll set up the book for us. Tell us about the characters, a little bit of the challenges they face. Sure. Um, This kind of the inspiration for this type of story is I've always been fascinated with sidekick characters. I don't know what that says about me as a person, but I've always been more interested in Robin than Batman. I don't know why. I just always identify with Robin a lot more. So when I wrote this, I wanted to do a story where the the main character was a sidekick and the sidekick was the main character. That's difficult to do from a structure point of view. So what I ended up with was a story where the main the main hero of the story looks like the sidekick. He's not very popular. He's not pretty. He's he's actually deformed. He has a a hump on his shoulder. And it's about him trying to find his place in the universe, this new world and connect with the outside world. So so to give you kind of the overview of the story, uh, it's. Set in the 1800s, the the city of Geneva is under attack by these hooded mask figures who uh, attack the poor in the middle of the night. They kidnap, they murder, they carry poison blades, and everyone lives in terror of them. So when a boy turns 16, he has to go help defend the city. And our main our main character, who starts off with no name, they call him Boy. Uh, he gets the he gets he turns of age and he has to go defend the city and through the course of this fight he becomes a friend to one of the most popular people in town they save each other's lives and they have to solve this mystery of the army of the dead so that's kind of the overview of the story neat well well, how did you come up i mean you you talked a little bit about your inspiration but how did you come up with the idea for this in particular set in geneva in the 1800s were there particular mm-hmm. reasons to place it in that time frame? I, I was always kind of fascinated by that time period because it's just the start of an old world of religion kind of falling away and the new world of technology starting to find its legs. Like it was around this time that industrialized started to become more common. Technology, like medical technology, became more advanced at this time period. So I wanted a story where the people who are rich and learned know that the world of science is starting while the people who are kind of poor and more common are still stuck in the world of superstition. 
So that was, it was an interesting time period to be there. There are a few time periods that have always been fascinating to me. This is one of them. So are you a history buff then? I am. I, I like to tell people that I like the interesting parts of history. So when I was a kid, I loved history, but I didn't enjoy learning an entire semester of, okay, this is when this treaty got signed. And, you know, like it, it just, the facts and figures bored me, but the events, the big events, you know, uh, the invention of the internal combustion engine, the invention of the printing press, how they changed the world at that time was always fascinating to me and the conflict that came from that. So in the book, are it does the boy and the non maybe educated people, do they have superstitions about who these beings are? Do they believe maybe there's some kind of supernatural or fantastical mm -hmm. element? Yep. And and I don't want to give it away, but you find out it's a much bigger story connected to other things throughout the book. And it's it's one of those things I've always been fascinated by when people can manipulate from behind the scenes. And that's all I'll, I'll reveal for now. But it's it's a great it's a lot of fun. It's a great story. It's watching these characters who a lot of them don't have an education and they have to struggle in this new developing world where education and knowledge is everything. And that that education and knowledge piece seems to be timeless and non generational. I mean, there's mm -hmm. you know, for what a throughout history, I would say that you know those that don't have access to whatever technology there is would be hindered or at a disadvantage, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah, that absolutely. shows itself. Maybe that shows itself more or less depending on how big the jump is between having access and not having access to that technology. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you take a look at in our modern world, I was doing research for a, another idea I had. I was fascinated by all the technology that I've never heard of. And I, I read this stuff and I was like, that ha that really exists now. And it was, it was kind of like, like the, the CRISPR technology for gene splicing. And they're like, yeah, you can buy one. I'm like, this is insanity. Like, how fast our technologies advance. So I think we're, this is kind of a reflector of us. This book is a set in a simpler time where technology is starting to advance. And like there's a scene in the book where one of the characters talks about a syringe, which had just been invented, I think in 1812 or 1805, something like that. And no one knew what they were, but these were technologies that doctors were starting to use and they become mainstream. So it was really interesting. It's an interesting time period to be part of, to have a story set in. Right. I can see people might be scared of that. I don't even like mm -hmm. syringes. So. <laughs> so how did you start writing? That's it's funny. I um all through my twenties and thirties, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grow up. So the theme I always said the joke I used to make is if I my twenties and thirties had a theme, it would be like, wow, that did not work. <laughs> no, that didn't work. Because <laughs> I failed at a lot of different businesses. I failed at a lot of things I tried. I never really found what I was looking for. So I had a sister that was living in LA and she was writing and, you know, for screen, screenwriting and that type of thing. And she, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be. She goes, come out and stay in LA with me for, you know, a little while and, and we'll talk about it. And she got me into screenwriting and I just got hooked instantly. And I've always been a reader, but I've never thought about actually telling my own stories. And so that was the start. I started working as a screenwriter, trying to get in as a famous screenwriter, but they weren't hiring. So, you know, I had to publish my own book instead. <laughs> Fine. I was going to say, I, being a screenwriter sounds like a dream job to most writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think so. But it was, you know, we we had a bunch of pitch meetings, I, myself and a writing partner, and we had people have interest in, they said, we might have to have you back. And we never did. So but I learned so much from that experience and I gained a passion for writing, which is, you know, where it, where it all comes from, I think. And is this your first fiction novel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this okay. is my first and fiction novel. Is it going to be part of a series or is it standalone? Nope. It's uh, definitely part of a series. There are six books in the series. I'm now outlining the third one right now. I, I think that's one of the things that came, that's a big advantage came from screenwriting is they're so fixated on script uh, outlining, like everything has to be outlined. And so that's how I learned to write. So when everyone asked me, do you have writer's block? I'm like, no, I just looked at the outline and I just start writing the next chapter. <laughs> do you find, okay. Do you find you like to write 
like that? Do you yeah. enjoy it? Yeah. Interesting. I, I don't think I, I've always tried. I, I'm always fascinated and impressed by people who are just like, I just start writing and the story comes to me. I'm like, man, that is awesome. I cannot do that. I need to know A to B to C to D to Z all the way through. I need to know before I start writing. Yeah, because I get bored. If I know what mm -hmm. I'm going to write beforehand, I get bored writing. It, it's not fun for me. Like, there's no there's no reason for me to keep going at that point for whatever <laughs> reason. Like, so usually I have, like, a, a general outline. Like, I know what's mm -hmm. going to happen at the beginning and the end. I may know, like, the major plot, a couple of major plot points. But then I need to fill in, like, all the fun up and downs and twists and turns. Or else I just get bored and will quit. <laughs> um, That's it awesome. It seems to me that you can outline in that much detail and just write and follow your outline. Oh, yeah. I mean, the outline for this book before I started was 115 pages because every scene was broken down, every character arc, every, you know, what this character wanted in this scene versus this character in conflict, all of it was broken down. It's the only way I can do it. I've tried the other way. It just kind of meanders off to its own little thing. So I'm like, okay, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I guess you can get off point sometimes. You have to reel yourself back in. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so tell me about what's planned for the rest of the series. Does it follow the same character or do we meet new yep. characters? It follows the the core three characters, but as mysteries get revealed at the end of the book, that sets them on a new path to find to solve those mysteries. And you start to find out there's a much bigger plan and much more sinister plan at play. Okay. And as our characters are developed, you they start developing into this world and seeing what this world is about and what's going on. Because you know, it's you take a look at everything in history. There's what's going on on the surface, and then you look a couple levels deeper. There are people at play trying to manipulate things, and that's a big part of this story. Um, and so it's a little bit of a good versus evil mm -hmm. underdog story as well it sounds like maybe yeah absolutely i i think that's one of the things i love about fantasy and fiction in general i've always loved stories where the good guy wins at the end because that doesn't happen always in life sometimes the bad guys just end up getting rich and it's like well that's not fun i don't enjoy that story no. so fantasy stories at the end the good guys win and they learn something and the and you as the reader gets carried along on that journey and i really love that fun and do we see this from the main character's point of view, is it first person mm -hmm. or are we looking third person here? We're looking third person. Um, I like to do third person omniscient. I, omniscient. I can't get into, I've tried to write first person. I just, I can't find it. I, I have, I know people that are great writers and they write first person and maybe someday, but I like the third person, you know, you watching from a distance. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. I like, I always wrote first person and it was, I just wrote my first third person book but it was really hard for me to make mm -hmm. that switch I had to think about it a lot and obviously editing comes in play in that but huge part of it yeah yeah it's, it's very hard for me to to think that way so mm -hmm. neat. And I, I think it's also I think it's also finding each character's unique voice um, and it's hard for me to find the line of okay am I just hamming it up as this character or is this how the character would think so for my first book, I just wanted to get it across the finish line. So I think I kind of took the path of least resistance for me personally. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what, I mean, if it feels comfortable for you and that's, you know, how you like to read maybe too and how mm -hmm. it's best. Because if you do, if you have like a lot of characters in a fantasy book, just having one point of view might limit what you can see and different mm -hmm books or styles I think may like a romance might be better in first person because you want to like know their ushy gushy feelings right mm -hmm. but in mm -hmm. fantasy maybe you need to know more than that so yeah yeah exactly Fun. what who are you or what or who are your inspirations when you're reading fantasy or horror probably my biggest inspiration has been Stephen King I've read him I think the first adult adult book I read when I was a kid was um, Eyes of the Dragon by Stephen King, which was a fantasy story. I think I was probably 12, 13 at the time. And it was like the first adult book I ever read. And I was hooked on his style. I've, I've loved his writing ever since. And he drifts in and out of fantasy and horror pretty well. You know, I mean, I've read the Gunslinger series was probably my favorite 
fantasy series I've ever read because it's not a strict fantasy series. It's much more um, connected to our world. So I think Stephen King's a big one. James Patterson, I've been a big fan of just from his business and marketing side of things. I watched a interview with him and he was talking about how he treats it like a business. And it was really fascinating to watch. Well, those, Yeah, those people are very fascinating. I've interviewed several authors that are more, I guess, seasoned authors and have tons, like 60, 70, hundreds of releases, um, sort of more on the level, not all the way up a level of James Patterson, but yeah, how like this one, Katie Cross, she produces a book every month. And she has wow. a team of like eight people behind her so mm -hmm. that she has this schedule schedule set. So, and then like, she's constantly asking her readers, okay, what do you want to learn next? And who do you want to hear? You know, what do you want to mm -hmm. know about next? In the, Cause she has this whole fantasy world built. And I'm like, wow, that is super cool. Impressive. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I think that's the, the thing that opened the door with self-publishing and Kindle and, and how much easier it is for us to put a book out now is you have to start thinking like a marketer and a business person as well, if you want to succeed. And it's really fascinating. Right. So do you have like hints for people of how to like start their first book if they're interested in that? Um, I think reading a lot of your genre helps a lot. I, I don't like everyone's like, oh, you could end up stealing somebody's ideas. I said, well, you know, I mean, I'll use Harry Potter. Harry Potter basically used Star Wars as its starting point, and it's still an incredibly successful book, you know? And I mean, there are certain universal truths in every genre. So I think just start reading your the, the type of genre you like a lot. I would say only write in a genre that you love because it's going to be a lot of work. And the whole like, oh, there's a lot of my, like, if somebody were to come to me and say, well, Brett, there's a lot of money in romance. I'd be like, that's great, but I can't write a romance <laughs> novel because I'd be bored 15 minutes in. That's not yeah. my thing. My wife, she would, she'd would she be great at it, but me, I'm, I'm more of a fantasy guy. So I think stick to who you are and stick to what you love, and that'll get you through the 15th rewrite of this, this scene. And I think that's what is a big part of it. <laughs> right. I, yeah, I'm, I genre hop, so... And I, but I read all the genres too. So mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense for me. Well, you were, you were just the opposite. I kind of, I'm sci-fi and fantasy and uh, I've been a big fan of Jack Reacher, but that's just kind of that one series that I like a lot. But for the most part, I'm fantasy sci-fi. So I'm always impressed when I meet somebody who can bounce from series to series. I've never been able to do it. And maybe you don't need to. If it makes you happy, <laughs> that's, that's what counts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Fun. And so you said you're writing the third book. So tell me of the titles and the names of the first two books. Is the second book already out too, or is that no? No, book? they. Uh, I finished the outline from the second one. It's actually with my uh, a couple of people that I really respect. They're reviewing it right now and giving me notes. Uh, the first book is Nameless versus the Army of the Dead. The second book is Nameless versus the Wolfmen of Moonlight Bay. The the third one is going to be Nameless versus the creature from Ebony Lake. And so after that, it, we started getting into spoilers. So I'm going to hold on to the rest. But those are the first <laughs> <Okay>. three. <laughs> Fine. Sorry, I must have misheard you that I thought you said you were outlining book three and not book two. So, Well, and I've finished the outline for book two and I'm going ahead to book three, just waiting for notes to come back, kind of okay. keeping that business line moving type of thing. Oh, okay, fun, fun. And I'm so is this your day job? Is this what you've made your day job now? No, I wish. Uh, <laughs> my uh, my day job is I work at a group home for adults with autism. So oh. that's that's my day job. And I've done it for 20 years. I love the work, but this is what I've always wanted to do. Keeps your brain active at night, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. And what is the name of the series? Uh, the Nameless Saga. The Nameless Saga. The name And you... You hinted at so are there wolves in the second book? Is that yep the the Wolfmen of Moonlight Bay is a my own unique spin on the werewolf story, um, mm -hmm. and I don't want to reveal too much, but it, I think it'll be a lot of fun, and I think I think the audience will get behind it. So it's it's you get at the end of this book, you'll get the preview chapter of the next book. So oh, fun! That's a lot of fun. I like werewolves, so I'm I would be interested oh, good. to hear about that and. So if someone asked you, well, I'll just go ahead and ask you, if, is there, what do you want your readers to get out of reading your book? Like, 
That's and a good it question. Could be, it could be just you want them to have fun and enjoy the book, but it could be Samarsa Mothers is something more. So I think for me, the main character who starts off nameless and eventually earns the name Lo through battle and and his friendship with the other main character. He's kind of a reflection of me when I was a young man, where I was kind of a geek when I was a kid. I was into sci-fi. I was into video games. I didn't have a lot of friends. So when you find your tribe of people, everything else kind of falls into place. And I think that's what part of this story is for me. And I think the audience, you don't have to be the most popular kid in school. As long as the people that you keep close to you care about you, I think you're going to be okay. And I think that's kind of the big theme of this. And as far as what I'd love them to take from it, that and have a good time. Enjoy the book. So, <laughs> yeah, I love that message. I have uh, my two sons are twins, but they just got off to college for their first semester at college. And oh, that's awesome. And, and I'm, and they're just, so they're just coming back for the holiday. But yeah, that's my whole thing is like, I want, I, I mean, I care about their grades, obviously, but first and foremost, mm -hmm. I want to be happy. And I feel like when you find your tribe of people or friends, then I mean, maybe not everyone needs friends. So I think most people need friends. But I think when you find those people that are your people, then that increases how well you feel like you're fitting in and how happy you'll be in a new place and all those things. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. So and I think it, it also makes you, being happy makes you a more productive person. Like I've looked on parts of my life where I was unhappy and parts of my life where I was happy. I'm always moving in a better direction, moving forward in everything, just anything from going to the gym to my passion projects. They're always better when you're in a good place, I think. Definitely. And it's interesting that now you do this super, it sounds like kind of a super social job now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, it is, but it's also kind of limited because it's structured because the people I work with, they have medical things that they need to deal with. So it's a very structured job, which I don't mind, but I like to be out in the community. I like to talk to people and, you know, we have a really solid group of friends that we talk to, but I, I don't know. I think that was kind of, this is kind of a memory of me when I was a little kid where I had no friends and I was kind of a geek. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. Tell well, us everywhere we can find you. Uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. I'm trying to get into TikTok, but they're just little videos of scenes from the book. Uh, those are the big three right now. And then the book will be available on Kindle Unlimited and on Amazon. Awesome. And is it your handle, Brett Como, just your author name? Yep. 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 Uh, it's a uh, storyteller, Brett, for uh, the Twitter, not Twitter, uh, TikTok. TikTok. I was just trying to think of it. <laughs> and That's then the cool. book is coming out January 15th. And this is the first book, right? Yep, it was first the first book, book in the just series. Just releasing January fifteenth. Amazing! Well, congratulations, and yeah, we will have you out just with your release. So that'll be an exciting time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It'll be great. Thanks. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Finding the Magic podcast. I'm your host author and podcaster Trisha Copeland, and I love getting behind the scenes. If you like the podcast, make sure to subscribe and stop in each week, discover new authors and books. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep finding the magic.